fans, welcome back. Episode 158 of the One to Go show. And I think we've got to start off with this because we didn't do any shows over the holidays. You know, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy New Year to, to you, Bert, to all of our listeners, our sponsors, everybody in the racing community. Bert, how was the holidays for you? Holidays were good. Uh, uh, um, just uh, not quite as hectic as normal because my mom's still recovering from her broken hip. So, uh, you know, just uh, just uh, stayed on the down low a little bit, but the holidays were good. How about you? Interesting. Well, you got stranded, didn't you? <laughs> I did. I, it could have been worse. It could have been worse. But yeah, I broke down out in uh, the home of the Keystone Cup for dirt late model racing, Bedford, Pennsylvania. And uh, maybe a blessing in disguise, right? Because there was a hell of a storm that went through. There was like a 50 car pile up in Ohio road that I would have been on. A lot, you know, there was tragedies on that. So I was stuck over Christmas in a hotel, but I guess I got paid for it, got to watch some football. Thank goodness that was a better Vikings game than what we saw last week. We went on to talk about that, right? I think maybe they let the Packers win. Uh, we won't, we well, won't get it. I mean, actually, I, I think the Packers did the Vikings a favor by giving them an ass whooping because uh, I think it opened their eyes. Well, maybe we're not as good as we thought we were. So we got to, we got to, clamped down on a few things <laughs> that's the first ass kick and they took this year okay so they've, <laughs> had, they've had plenty so that they should have had that figured out by now but uh, <laughs> you know the holidays was you know it, it wasn't i mean christmas is always great it's christmas but like it, it could have been worse i was stuck in a hotel new year's was a lot better than christmas was so there is that but hey we're into 2023 and you know uh got to thank our sponsors we got a lot of sponsors here let's start with dirt track supply been a great supporter of the show here for quite a while great supporter of dirt track racing as a whole you know kind of your go-to for anything racing whether it's racing suits that time of year right if it's tires if it's parts they build the aero chassis they do a lot of different they do a lot of stuff they do a lot of fab work over there at dirt track supply you know ron and trevor have done phenomenal stuff for the racing community for a long time get a hold of dirt track supply watertown south dakota for all things racing so bert what do you say we jump into a little blast to the past we'll start with that again episode 158 brought to you by impact health sharing i know open enrollment's done but there's still a lot of people you can sign up for our healthcare program bert at any time okay you don't have to sign up during a certain period you know if you're a business out there self-employed you're paying too much if you just want a quote, you want to get some info, get a hold of me, get me a message, no obligations. I can get you the numbers. You can look at the information if it's a good fit. It's been a good deal for a lot of people, saving people a lot of money to put back into your race program. Maybe spend it over at Dirt Track Supply. Who knows, wherever you want to spend it. But with that said, uh, number 158, I don't have a 158. I have a couple 58s. How about you? I do not have a 158, but uh, yeah, I have a couple of 58. Who do you got? We'll let, we'll let the age before beauty. Well, beauty ain't here either. So we'll just go with eight. Okay. All right. Slip. Um, well, I mean, you have to, being from Eastern Wisconsin, you got to start off with um, um, AJ Demo's grandfather, Pappy, Pappy Demo. And I actually have some uh, cool photos uh, from when he, Pappy raced the coops. And so I'll get those sent in so we can uh, share those with, with you guys in the video. But uh, obviously Pappy Demo um, and uh, Pappy Demo is in the um, Shano Speedway Hall of Fame. And, um, and then um, I believe AJ's dad also raced the 58 if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so that's a half of a legacy right there. I, did, I never realized, I knew that he had a throwback car. I think that was maybe the beginning of this past year that was it red and blue or red, white, and blue. Mm -hmm. We had the throwback. I didn't know if he was a third generation racer or not. And I did not know that, you know, being from Northern Minnesota, I did not know that, I guess, before he even had the throwback car. I had no idea because I'm not from there. But what a legacy. One of the best racers really throughout our region for sure but i think he could probably compete on a national level aj demo and that demo family they they've been very successful in dirt racing yeah and actually the night that pappy demo was inducted into the shano speedway hall of fame uh, aj had a retro 
uh, uh, graphic scheme on his late model, uh, going back to one of Pappy's cars that uh, he raced. And I actually uh, made a die cast of that car. So um, it's, um, I like to make die casts of uh, special cars like that. Yeah, you've done a lot of them. That's pretty cool. You know, too bad. Do you have a picture of that die cast? Maybe you can send that over and throw that. Yes, I have a picture of it. Yes. Well, if you're listening on the podcast side of things, jump onto YouTube. And, you know, even if you want to just look at the beginning part of the show, you know, we have pretty cool throwback <clears throat> picks. It's kind of fun to look at some of that stuff. So any other 58s there, Bert? Uh, I do not have any other 58s. Oh, I got two. And I... Quite honestly, I couldn't remember this guy's name. So thanks, Les Doolman, for helping me out here. Uh, Dirt Ruler Chassis down in southern Minnesota. But Jeff Rollinger, I think it's Rollinger. I don't think it's Rollinger. I think it's Rollinger. But he ran the number 58 Superstock. And I remember him racing over when Fulton City. It's now Mississippi Thunder Speedway. But it used to be the Tri-Oval Speedway. Very unique racetrack. But he got around that place well. Also raced over at Arcadia, I think down at Deer Creek, Cass in kind of that southern Minnesota. But Jeff Rollinger, a guy that I raced against, and I think he did jump up into the modified division for a while. The modified division, very strong in that region. Speaking of modifieds, Bert, I got another one here. You remember Craig Scott? Yes. He, he also raced the late model. He did. And I remember him. It said Scott with the big zero yep. on, yep. on the or did it say, it said Scott, right? I think it said Yeah, I think Scott. it said Scott. Yeah. So it said, uh, so, but Craig Scott tragically lost his life. I might have been at a racetrack maybe um, quite a few years ago. Now his kid was very successful um, for quite a while in racing as well. I don't think he gets around anymore on the dirt. But the fact is uh, he ran a modified number 58, Bert. And I was looking back through some pictures. Jimmy Mars also drove that 58 and I believe that's when Craig Scott was still alive. I think he was driving, you know, drove a couple shows, got a cool picture here. Jimmy Mars was a lot younger than he was right now. Um, but no different in victory lane, carrying the checkered flag, but Craig Scott, uh, 58, another guy just lost too soon in the racing community. So speaking of lost too soon and well, well like, before we move on, um, you might know this. There, I think there's an Iowa driver that raced 58. Was it was Eckrick a 50? I know Eckrick was also was a 50, but I think there might have been another one that raced 58. I think you're right. I think there was brothers, and I don't remember the name. Somebody, if you got it right, if you remember it, we can look that up. Maybe post it in the comments. But I think you're right. I think there was one of the Eckridge family, uh, w -Dar WDRL late model guy, probably NASCAR um, series as well. But uh, I think you're right there, Bert. That's something maybe uh, somebody can post in the comments, maybe a picture of it. Good catch, good catch. So Bert, we'll jump off topic. We'll, we'll, we'll bring this around for everybody, right? We'll bring this around full circle. I know it's not a football show, but a lot of racers like football too. But you know, in, in case you live under a rock, Right. In case you haven't heard, Monday Night Football this week, Bert, was was shut down. Uh, DeMar Hamlin, sec, I think second year player for the Buffalo Bills. You know, there was a hit kind of looked like a routine hit to me. You know, didn't look mm -hmm. anything serious, but he got up from the hit, jumped right up and he fell over. Like I've never seen a person fall over. Like that's not a natural way to fall over. And they had to resuscitate him. They had to give him CPR on the field. Players devastated. They went back in the locker room. They shut the game down. They said, "Hey, we're we're not we're not in the state of mind to be playing football tonight." And uh, they actually made the decision. They're not making up that game this week, right? Which I thought was weird. We'll get into that. Our thoughts on that, but uh, kind of bring that back to racing, right? Because I've seen people post, "Well, if that happened in a racetrack, they'd cancel right away." And you know, you, you see, everybody's everybody's an expert. We are. We like to be the expert too, right? We're we're really not. We just like to have fun. We're bit, we're race fans that like to talk. It's kind of what we are. But they, I was kind of taken back. I was not surprised that they called the game for the night and they said, "Hey, we're we're done for the night." I, I'm cool with that. I was very surprised that they didn't just go ahead and reschedule it, play it the next day. I, that surprised me. Um, in fact, from what I understand, is they said they're going to play this weekend's game and they're going to determine that if the outcome of that game is going to maybe 
change the playoff picture as far as seedings. Then they'll play it. If it's not, they're going to cancel it. I thought that was kind of a weird deal. Um, what was, I guess, what was your thoughts on that deal? And then uh, any anything happened in your area, maybe where a racer, a fan, somebody at the racetrack, maybe, maybe a lot. This guy did not lose his life. He's still alive. He's, he's you know, DeMar Hamlin is, you know, I'm, he's not out of the woods by any means. We're, we're recording this on Wednesday night. And at this time, anyway, he's, uh, you know, they're working to try to get him breathing better. They, he's still with us. Thank well, you. And, well, the, the latest report I saw was that, I mean, he sh he's shown improvement. I mean, yeah, he's still not out of the woods, but he's shown improvement. And I mean, that's a positive sign. Um, you know, you know, that's all you that's what you hope for at, at this point that he just continues to improve. I mean, it's not something where he's, it's just going to be, you know, Oh, he's better. You know, it's going to be, it's going to be a road to recovery and right. hopefully a recovery. Right. And whether it's football or racing, you know, I mean, to us, you know, we've been around racing our whole life. And when I was racing, it was straight up my whole life. That's what I did. I, I raced. And, and I felt like the most important thing in the world was racing. That's kind of what I felt, right? Well, this kind of gives you a different perspective on that. You know, this, I think the closest thing this reminded me to was the Ryan Newman incident. Um, you know, Dale Earnhardt deal was, that was abrupt. We found out shortly thereafter that we lost Dale Earnhardt, not, not a couple hours or whatever. But the fact of the matter is when Ryan Newman crashed at Daytona, there was so much uncertainty. Like they didn't say a word, right? We didn't know if he was alive, dead. Like I, we were all kind of well, assuming first. And, and in that situation too, they put up the, I don't know if you remember, they put the tarps up so you yep. couldn't see what was, what was taking place. I talked to a couple track promoters about that in certain insurance companies. That's what they say to do. If there's a, if there's a bad incident, life or death, where it's like really, really bad, they want you to tarp the whole thing off, which is, which is good. You know, the players at the football game, they kind of tried to build a little bit of a wall around because I mean, first of all, I don't even want to watch that. I don't want to see somebody, especially if the guy dies. I don't want to watch the guy die. Right. You know, and that, and respect the guy for, for goodness sake. So that's why they do it. But have, has there been anything in eastern Wisconsin or have you ever been at an event, a race or anything where somebody lost their life, whether it was a fan, a worker, a participant? And, and how, if, if so, how do they handle it? I have never been at an event where um, somebody lost their life or even seriously got injured. I mean, I guess I guess you could consider myself lucky in that regard because. I mean, you never want to to see that. I mean, I've seen some pretty bad wrecks and stuff, but they've always, uh, you know, got a, out of the car under their own power. Well, I have been to a few races where they've had to cut the cut, you know, cut the cut the roll cage off to get the driver out of the car on the on the backboard because they're taking precautions because of neck injuries and back injuries. Uh, but luckily, I have never um witness a race where uh somebody died yeah and, and, and i was unfortunately you know and you know i was 1998 labor day shootout one of my dad's very good friend of our family you know dan claus who um he ran his heat race in the super stock division wasn't feeling well took a bunch i think toms or rollades or whatever thought he had heartburn and next thing you know he tipped over had a heart attack at the track didn't make it and that was in the middle of the race program in the pits and I mean, it was a tough deal. He'd been around that, that, you know, racing community for a long time at that point. And a lot of people were shaken up and, you know, they, at that point, you know, the family was all there and they said, Hey, we're, we're just going to continue racing right, wrong or indifferent. You know, I've seen different incidents or heard about them where something happened during the event and they're like, Hey, you know, I mean, it's, it's tragic. It's terrible. And I don't know if there's a right or wrong here, but in that incident, they kept going and it was tough. I mean, it was, you know, a close family friend of ours. And, you know, I, I went out and I actually double swept the Labor Day shootout that weekend. And it was, I mean, incredibly bittersweet. I mean, that should have been like a highlight, right, of, of my racing career. But it was just overshadowed by the loss. You know, and you look at Turbo, right? You know, we come back to Gateway Dirt Nationals. He goes down there. His dad 
loses his life. Um, I believe it was Wednesday when they got to St. Louis heart attack. I think it was, and they just kind of, Hey, we're, we're going to collectively just kind of keep it quiet. Go do our thing. We'll mourn later. Everybody mourns differently. I mean, what's your thoughts? I mean, you hear people's comments. I mean, if somebody loses their life during an event, should they just cancel it all together or should they go with the old adage of the show must go on? You know, what, what's your thoughts? Uh, well, I'll tackle that uh, in a second. Uh, but, you know, I agree with you from the standpoint that, uh, I mean, everybody does mourn differently. I mean, you don't know how you're going to react until it actually happens. Um, I mean, you know, you mentioned turbo. Uh, I mean, I've never been at a, at a race where somebody passed away, but I, I was at a race when I found out that my dad died of a heart attack. Um, I was, <laughs> I was actually at Cedar Lake Speedway for the Wissota 100 and it was Saturday afternoon. And this was before I carried a cell phone. This was in 2004. So I didn't carry a cell phone with me all the time. And, uh, so my mom actually called the new Richmond police department and then they sent the officer to the racetrack to find me. And, um, it's never good when an officer approaches you and tells you, you have to call home. <laughs> um so you know and you know, after i found out you know um you know i had obviously i had the pick you know the racing family was around me and you know they gave me somebody offered me their car so i could have drove home and you know it's just like you know I didn't know what to do. I actually wound up staying for the races. And then after the races were over that night, uh, me and another pit crew member, he drove me home uh, dr back to Eastern Wisconsin. So, um, but like I said, you don't know how you're going to react until it actually happens. And then you look back and you kind of think, well, was that the right way to react? You know, there is no, there is no right or wrong way. Um, right to react but as far as the show continuing in that situation um you know there's been there's been bad injuries on the football field before you know uh you know players have been paralyzed on the playing football and you know they, they they put them on the cart and they haul them away and the game has always continued i think what made this different was the fact that the players had to see had to watch well they didn't have to watch but you know they saw they saw the cpr and everything taking place and you know they knew it was a life and death situation and you know i don't blame them for not wanting to play that night right after it happened i mean i kept um back in the late 90s and early 2000s i followed wrestling pretty close and um the first thing i thought of was when owen hart died i don't know if you remember that and I, I i've watched some documentaries about that and some of the you know especially the announcers who were announcing that night they said the worst thing that they did was that once they took him out of the ring they just continued on with the show like nothing happened and I mean, basically they knew already that he was, that he had, he was dead when they took him out of the ring. Um, so I kept thinking about that and I kept thinking there's no way they can continue this game tonight. Right. Right. Yeah. I think, I, I think in hindsight, they're probably the best move to cancel the game. It'll be crazy to me if they don't reschedule it, it'll be tough if they reschedule it next week, but you know, it's just kind of weird how a lot of people, whether it's racing football, whatever it is, a lot of people, ah, it's just a game. It's just a game. Well, sports is a lot bigger, and it's a lot bigger part of people's lives than we even like to admit. I mean, a lot of times we're going through some dark times or, you know, going through some stuff, and that sports, whether it's racing or sports, can be one heck of an escape to kind of help try to keep you a little bit sane. And uh, so, I mean, it's a very vital part of our lives, but at the end of the day, life itself is more important than the game. So uh, hopefully he's okay, and hopefully we don't have to deal with any of that in the racing world. I mean, it's hard enough when you lose somebody in the racing world, but at an event would be horrible. So, Bert, let's jump on. Uh, you know, we were going to do this at the end of the year. We took the holiday season off, 
But let's start with the top five national stories of the 2022 season. And when I say national stories, Bert, this is more of a, if we, if we put together this video and you look back at it 10 years from now, what top, what are the top five things that you're like 2022? Oh yeah. Yeah. That happened in 2022. That was a big deal, you know, in the racing world, of course. And uh, we've broken down to five. There's probably more than that. And everybody might have a, you know, put in the comments, maybe if, if you have something you think is top five worthy that we didn't touch on, we'd like to hear that. But this segment, of course, brought to you by Brad Parson. Um, he's got lots of different products for egg solutions. Um, you know, you can put stuff all type, all seasons too, not just the spring. He's got products for all seasons, you know, that you can mix right with your current spray packages. If you're looking to increase profitability, increase your yields. If you're looking for a great 2023 in farming, especially Western Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, there's a lot of you racers that you should probably give him a call. Get a hold of Brad Parson. He'll take good care of you. He's got some really good stuff. So, Bert, number five. What can we yeah, start we're, with? We're, we're, <laughs> get, we're gonna get rid of the asphalt uh, story right away. <laughs> yes, we are. So, video game move by Ross Chastain. Um, final, I guess, the final night of the last stage, getting into the championship to lock him into the final four with that unbelievable move on the high side. Um, well, would you say that's going to go down as something maybe never duplicated? Never, never. I mean, that's never happened except for on days of thunder, right? It happened on days of thunder, but other than make believe it's never happened. And, you know, when you look back at NASCAR, you look back at 2022 NASCAR, I think was increasingly popular. It's kind of coming back. And I think a lot of it's because of the drivers that we watched, a lot of them are up in the booth now, you know, and they make it kind of fun because they're kind of bantering and telling old stories. I, I really enjoy that aspect of it probably more than the race itself. Right. But when it comes to it in one event that happened on a racetrack, is there anything in your mind that's even that big in the last decade, two decades? Um, NASCAR wise, no, I mean, I mean, that move will be talked about, uh, for years and years into the future. And, um, you know, what, when I was younger, I would always buy, you know, the NASCAR videos about, you know, different aspects, you know, the best crashes or the best finishes and that sort of thing. And this is going to be in every video that is put together for resale uh, regarding NASCAR. I totally agree. So, Bert, let's jump on to number four. You take this one. What do you got? Um, yeah. Uh, um, Nick Hoffman, a uh, dominant uh, driver, was in a uh, uh, bad hauler accident, actually. And um, and he was injured and um, had a concussion. Uh, race shortly after the accident, but apparently he didn't have the doctor's approval for that. He won. Um, <laughs> he won. He got the and won, and they're like, yeah. Um, but yeah, then I mean, it's that was in what September. So I mean, it's been like that. several months since he has raced. Uh, but uh, um, that didn't stop him from getting a late model ride for next year. And uh, actually, I saw a Facebook post from him uh, today. I don't know if he made the post today or when he made it, but uh, he plans on racing in the Chili Bowl. And uh, so he's going to be flying. He, he posted a schedule. He's going to be in Tulsa. Then he's going to fly back to a shop to work on his late model. Then he's flying back to Tulsa to race. And then he's got to fly back to the shop to finish the late model because then on Monday, they're going down to Florida to do testing at uh, Volusia and uh, golden or going to Georgia golden Isle. And uh, so so yeah, he said that uh, he feels great, and uh, the doctors have given him, given him the okay to go race. So uh, he's uh, gonna fill that racing schedule up real fast. <laughs> yes, I mean, what an unbelievable story, right? I mean, the, the most dominant UMP mod driver over the last couple of years. He's been unbelievable, you know. And then from right at the top, right to like literally not even sure if he's going to live. Like it was pretty touch and go. It sounds like that when that happened, 
And then he'd been kind of looking, been in and out of late models a little bit, kind of looking for that good ride and got into the Ty Torg ride that was vacated by, of course, Devin Moran. So uh, good luck to Nick Hoffman. I tell you, he's a, a very, very good race car driver. He's going to be fun to watch. It'll be interesting to see what he does in 2023. Number three, Bert, uh, the tragic passing of Rick Eshelman, the voice of the world of outlaw late models. Yeah, um, you know, that was shocking when uh, uh, when that news broke that uh, that he had passed. And, um, you know, it just uh, he his name was just uh, synonymous with uh, with the world of outlaws. And, uh, you know, when you thought of world of outlaws, you thought of him because, you know, he was always doing the announcing. So, uh, yeah, that was that was definitely um, a sad deal. Yeah, and that just tells you right there. I mean, just be nice to people. I we don't know the story. We probably never know really the whole story, what happened there. But mental illness, depression, that type of stuff is real. And and it's masked. There's a lot of people out there going through stuff mentally. You have no idea. You know, they could have the biggest smile on their face all day long. You have no idea what's going on in their mind. You know, so just uh keep that in mind, you know, and and uh I didn't know a lot about him. I just kind of, you know, I've, of course we knew about him as far as an announcer standpoint, but hearing some of the stories that a lot of the race teams and the crews and the families of the race teams talked about, man, he was a, he was a big part of the racing community. He wasn't just an announcer. He was a friend to the, to the racing world, especially dirt late models. And, uh, you know, it sounded like he was a guy that really liked to, you know, really liked to get together and actually communicate and connect with everybody in the racing community. So that was a tragic loss for the racing world in 2023. Number two, Bert, over in Wisconsin. Yep. I mean, some people may say, well, how can you put this in the top five or especially number two? But I mean, when, when, when you consider the, well, obviously number two is uh, Jimmy Myers uh, announcing that he was retiring from dirt late model racing and I mean, when you think of dirt late model racing in Wisconsin, you know, over the last, um, um, you know, when you associate Wisconsin and national dirt late model racing scene, you know, Jimmy Mars is the driver that comes to mind, you know, over the past, you know, what, 30, 35 years. Um, so, uh, you know, him announcing his retirement, um, um, wasn't shocking because I, I, I told the story several times, but I interviewed him probably five years ago for a story for dirt late model racing. And he, he told me he would, he would not be racing when he was 50 years old. So, so, uh, he kept true to that. And, uh, but it's still, um, still kind of sad, uh, to see him, uh, step out of the, um, be, from behind the wheel but i have a feeling we'll we'll see him race here and there in some some shows <laughs> yeah he's into one every now and then we'll see we'll see maybe maybe not i mean he's done it all and quite honestly i look back and actually jeff our late model expert shot me over you know some info when we talked about him here when he did retire and i looked at his website and i'm like oh my god like i had no idea some of these races he won because a lot of them were I mean, some of them might have been streamed, but live streaming, dirt on dirt, all that stuff wasn't as big as it is now. So his accomplishments are second to none in late model racing in our region, for sure. I mean, and he's done it on the national stage, completely dominated in local late model action. And of course, they have MB Customs. He's got Dustin Sorensen stepping in, going to go uh, down to the Wild West shootout. Good luck to him. He's a hell of a driver in the modified. I, I expect nothing less in the late model, but uh, congratulations on a great career, Jimmy Mars. And number one, Bert, take it away. Number one, well, you got to go with a uh, $2 million man, uh, Superman. Um, you know, we, uh, we spent a lot of time on the show debating whether he would get the 2 million or not. And uh, last, last, his last race of the year, he, he eclipsed the $2 million mark. And um, I mean, anybody who wins over $2 million in one year racing a dirt late model has, that has to be the number one storyline of the year. Unbelievable. And, and to think how bad he started the season, 
Like, he was awful at Speed Weeks. Like, we're going, like, this ain't good. Like, he was not good at Speed Weeks. And I think he, he even skipped Volusia. I don't think he went to Volusia for that final stretch. I think he just scrapped it and went home. But I tell you what, when he got hot, stayed red hot throughout. So, yeah, I mean, if we think back to 2022, the year of money, a lot of big money shows, he took home the lion's share. And uh, congratulations, great season to Jonathan Davenport. Now, let's jump into some local stuff. And uh, we'll do the, the best of 2022. Going to kind of do a power rankings deal, um, kind of the top five in a lot of different things, maybe some thoughts on some different things or whatever. But uh, this Bert brought to you by BuyRaceShirts.com. Um, for racers, buy racers. Jordan Tollickson got a great company down there in Montevideo, Minnesota. <clears throat> so racers, it's that time of year, right? We're starting to look at 2023 here. You know, if you're looking to get apparel, whether it's hats, hoodies, shirts, you name it, get a hold of Jordan at buyracers.com. They got a lot of different ways that you can purchase it. You know, you don't need to buy big, big numbers to make this happen, but uh, get a hold of him. He'll take good care of you. He does great work down there in Montevideo. So where should we start, Bert? Well, we're staying with the five team. We have the top five stories of the year. So we're going to do the top uh, five drivers for the different uh, Wasota divisions. Um, so let's start with um, the street stocks, uh, your top five in the, in the Wasota street stocks. All right. All right. So probably going to hurt some feelings here, Bert, because there's, there's a, this class was highly competitive. There's a lot of drivers that, you know, arguably could be on this list, right? You know, and, and I'll mention a couple honorable mentions first that they had great seasons. They didn't quite make the list, right? But they had great seasons. And I'm going to start with Maria Brooksick. Um, she had uh, on the year, she had nine wins over there in South Dakota. Every time I turned her on, Bert, podium, second, third, second, third, and I did not go back. Somebody, I wish somebody would, but go back and do the research. She started like eighth every night, every night, because she was so consistent starting, you know, finishing second, third all the time. She always had the high point average all year long at all of her tracks and had to work her way to the front. So a great year for Maria Brooksick. A couple young guns there that had great seasons. I think you're going to really have to watch out for these guys in 2023. 16-year-old from Wisconsin, Ty Agan. He won a few ra won a few races in the street stock, won some Stephas Tour races, and young gun uh, Colton Brower, second generation driver. I think might be third. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but for sure second. His brother Braden Brower is a stud, but Colton Brower took some wins from him. But you know, maybe might have been a factor in keeping Braden Brower out of the national championship race because Colton kind of stole his thunder a few nights. You know, he was only 15 years old. I think he's going to be 16 come race time. So two young guns. But let's start with number five. Tucker Peterson, this driver up in uh, northwestern Minnesota, runs over in Grand Forks, runs in Greenbush. 12 wins on the year. He's 18 years old, I believe. He's a sad. I think it's Joey Peterson's kid. Somebody correct me on that. But every time I turned around, victory lane. And when the Steffes Tour came to town, he was highly competitive with them. Tucker Peterson, number five. Number four, we're going to head west. There's a couple drivers out there that could have been made the list. Some people would probably say it should have been Corey Craver. I don't know. Jeremy Castro, spin to win, 17 wins on the season. Burt Arrow Chassis as well. Arrow Chassis for this guy, 17 wins. Outstanding season. Not sure what his plans are for this upcoming year, but a great year for Jeremy Castro out in Montana and I think he might have raced some Wyoming too, but he came over our way a couple times. Number three, Braden Brower, Colton's brother, older brother. 16 wins on the year. Um, unbelievable ride over at the Wasota 100. I mean, just a great season. His brother took a couple from him. And, uh, boy, he got snake bit. You know, he got snake bit. There's a few times he had the lead and just wasn't able to capitalize. In the beginning of the year, he was kind of struggling. And then they switch cars and he got instantly right back to where he was. But uh, not sure what his plans are for this upcoming year, but both of those Browers are going to visit, visit Victory Lane a lot. Number two, the Wolverine, Justin Vogel. 20 wins, Steffes Street Stock Tour Championship, runner up in the Wasota Street Stock National Title Race. He won a lot of big races. And this is a guy here, Bert, that I, 
at the Wasota 100, unbelievable. He won one of the um, qualifying nights, and he said, no, I'm, I'm racing to win. I still mathematically with it. Then he ended up getting wrecked, had to come through the B, started way back like 27th or something like that, and charged all the way up. I think he would have won the feature. The Browers are going to be mad at me for that. He would have been in contention to win the feature. Let's go with it that way. And there was a yellow. And he ended up uh, clipping a car that was in the wall opening in the back straightaway. It was kind of a bad deal. They ended up canceling the race. They gave him third. But Justin Vogel, a guy that when he unloads, this kid this kid is a hell of a race car driver. Fun to watch. Always the life of the party. And uh, I think he's going to be back in 2023. Number one, I talked to this guy before the season last year. And he told me, he goes, my goal is to win the Wasota Street Stock National Championship. Called his shot, got it done, 27 wins, the 11 of Kyle Dykoff. Oh, man, what a season he had. I don't know if he's going to race this year. Sounds like he sold everything. Sounds like he might take a year off or whatever, or maybe jump up into a different class. I haven't quite heard, which is good news for all the street stock drivers, but Kyle Dykoff was fun to watch. And I don't know, two years ago when I was doing the power ranking show, I kept saying, Kyle Dykoff was the fastest driver in the street stock class. I mean, the, the eye test said this kid was super fast, but two years ago, he was inconsistent. He'd be fast, he'd, he'd win, then he'd drive off the track, and then he'd break, you know, all kinds of craziness, right? Last year, he put it together, held it together, consistency, kept the state of mind where he needed to be. Hell of a season, national championship for Kyle Dykoff. All right. And uh, let's move on to uh, the Midwest Mods. Midwest Modified Division. Bert, did you, I mean, you got anything on the street stocks? I know you watched a little bit. You're an Eastern guy. You don't get the class over there. Anything I, on the street stocks, Midwest Mods? What sticks out to you on either of those two classes? Well, Midwest Mods, obviously, uh, Kennedy Swan is the driver that, that comes to mind. Uh, you know, she had, she had a really good year um last year i'm not quite sure how it compared to other drivers in the division so uh, i'm curious to see see where she falls in your standings she, she's right there and, and i put her as an honorable mention i mean arguably the season she had she could have probably been in the top five very close but eight wins on the year i mean she was very good and it sounds like i think i could be wrong i think she's moving into an a mod for the 2023 season from what I understand. I don't know if that plan has changed, but that's kind of what the talks were. What eight wins on the year? Right? What was she, 16 years old maybe last year? You know, so a 16-year-old in a B-Mod winning that many races and that competitive, that is something. And, you know, some will say, hey, she's a she's a girl too. Well, tell you what, she, she's just as fast, if not faster than a lot of those boys out there. So a great season for Kennedy Swan. Another driver that caught my mind, limited schedule this year. Of course, you go to South Dakota, Mikey Nichols, um, him, Brotherton, Heinzerling, those those three out there did not quite make the list, but any of those three can unload anywhere, be super fast. 2023, uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But let's go to number five. A little controversy here, right? I'll probably get a little hate mail for this, but at number five, Jake Smith. Okay, 21 wins on the year, and I think he was 18, maybe 19 years old, won the Wasota Midwest Modified National Championship outstanding season. And uh, a lot of people are like, they're, they're down on him. A lot of people are down. Oh, he's a cherry picker. He's this, he's that. He, he's, they had a goal. They set out mine. They went out. They got it done. End of story. Don't hate the player. Hate the game. It is what it is. He also won some big shows. He did. He won, he won some races that were 1,000 to win. He won races where there was – a quality group of cars, a big number of cars. So it's not like he only won them low car count shows, but overall his strength of schedule probably kept him out of the top three in this conversation. But he's, a, I mean, he's young. He's a kid. He's still, you know, he's still young and he had a hell of a season. I think he's going to be a guy to watch and progress this year as well. You know, again, I mean, hopefully he races more money shows, but you know, you can't blame a guy for where he races and he set the goal out, he accomplished it, and he's your national champion. Number number four, Bert. More hate mail. I'll get more hate mail on this one. He could probably be higher too. Um, 
actually, you know what? I'm going to put him three. I'm going to switch this around. But number four, I'm going to go with Tyler Kittner. Buddy of mine. Jumping back up into the AMOD division, Bert. So 13 wins and 25 shows. Finally, Tyler, finally got his first Labor Day shootout win. What a big moment. I mean, the Kittner family as a whole at the Hibbing Raceway, I mean, just a huge part of that. The Labor Day shootout's always been like our event to win. He's always come up just a little short. It was super cool seeing him get that Labor Day shootout win. Really pumped to see that. Jumping into the AMODs, that leaves me with this question. Remember a couple of years ago, Skeeter Esty was the guy that dominated, you know, in the area with the with the Midwest mod. He moved up. Tyler stepped into that role. He started t- kind of taking that role over. Tyler's jumping up into the AMODs. The question up in northern Minnesota, Grand Rapids, Hipping, those tracks, which one of you drivers is going to fit that role to come in and start taking over them wins? Mervyn Castle, maybe one of them young, sec, another second generation guy. Another guy, uh, Samuel Blevins. Keep an eye on that name. He really looked good at an invitational over in uh, Buffalo River at the end of last year. He could be a guy to kind of take that role and step in a second year in the class, take over for Tyler Kittner. But let's get into uh, number three here. Number three from Superior, Wisconsin. We got Cody Carlson. Cody Carlson. Kind of like me. He'll say what's on his mind. Probably hurt some feelings along the way. Ruffled some feathers. Had some controversy along the way. Nine wins. He had an outstanding season. He won the border battle. I think he won night two of the Labor Day shootout. But just a great year overall for Cody Carlson. And uh, he's kind of trending upward with that 32. Number two, I didn't know which one to give it to. So I'm giving it to Team Canada. Is how I'm going to word this. Team Canada is getting number two. There's three drivers up there, Bert. You got, first of all, I guess a little bit further west, we got Brandon Rehill. Um, 13 wins on the year, kind of runs in uh, Emo, Kenora. Really, really strong season for him. And then you had two absolute studs up at the Thunder City Speedway in Thunder Bay. David Simpson with 13 wins on the year. Cole Chernoski with a pile of wins. Both of them come down to the States to some, some big shows and got them done there. Um, Chernoski actually won the XR Northern Storm Series for the Midwest Modified Division, you know, that five-night swing. So both all them cats are fast. Um, David Simpson right up there in the national standings. And Thunder Bay Bird, they average like 40 Midwest mods at night, right? So they're not racing against five cars and getting all these wins. They had like 40 cars. It's the biggest car count of any class at any track um, weekly in Wasoda is the Midwest Mods in Thunder Bay. And those two split a lot of wins up there. And when they come, they're strong. They're, they're fun to watch. So I'm going to put that Team Canada, number two. At number one, I'm going to go with the Nightmare, Lucas Rodin. Not quite the season he had a year ago winning the national championship. Kind of had some up and downs, but when the money was on the line, he performed. Started out the season with a 10,000 a win deal down at uh, Humboldt, and then he won the 5,000 a win deal over at the Cedar Lake Speedway. He won the Rebel Midwest Modified Tour for the second year in a row, but uh, I tell you, when the money was on the line, the 19 car, extremely fast. Not sure what his plans are for this upcoming season, but Lucas Rodin. Um, if you had to take all the Midwest Modifieds, right, and you put them in a hat and you said, when these guys unload their cars at the track, which one scares you the most? That 19 is there to win. I mean, he's he's fun to watch, and there's a, there's a lot of them out there. Highly competitive class. That's our top five for 2022. All right. Now uh, let's uh, move to uh, your favorite division, uh, <laughs> the Super Stocks. I think I might know who number one is in this in this division. You, you probably do, but I don't know if you can pick out the next four, right? So Probably not. <laughs> well, I'm going to go with a couple people that caught my eye here. You know, Tristan Labarge kind of taking over that role up in Hibbing, Grand Rapids. You know, if he can just kind of keep things together, I think he's going to have a big season in 2023. Another driver, second-generation guy, Kyle Kopp, um, won his second straight legendary 100. And, uh, Boy, I tell you what, I just have a feeling that this is a year Kyle Kopp is going to emerge and kind of take over that role as a top guy in the area between 
you know, I don't know where he's going to race Saturdays. He kind of bounces between Rice Lake and, and Cedar Lake, but he'll race Superior. He'll race Proctor. That 26 car, Bert, is going to be really, really fun to watch this year. But let's go with number five. I called it at the beginning of the season. I said, this guy here is going to have double digit wins in the super stock division. And he did. He hit 10. Dylan Nelson, your 2022 fast lane super stock series champion. And uh, actually won one of those races as well. Great year, kind of a breakout season for Dylan Nelson. He's just getting stronger and stronger from over in Merrifield, Minnesota, over by Brainerd. And I, I, I expect him to, to surpass that. He got 10 wins this year. I'm going I'm to call my shot right now. He's going to hit 15 this year in uh, 2023. Keep an eye on that 25 of Dylan Nelson. Number four, another generational talent here, Taryn Spacek. Started out strong, Bert. At the beginning of the year, I'm like, this guy here has a legitimate shot to dethrone Shane Sarasky. And then he kind of hit a little bit of a lull, had a couple rough nights, and then he started racing Eagle Valley, Cedar Lake a little bit more. And uh, just kind of gave up on the whole Wasota deal because it's it's tougher for him over there in uh, central Wisconsin to quite travel. Not as many racetracks to hit. But uh, when the money was on the line, the 22 car really reminded me of Kevin Burdick. It just looks tight in the middle of the corner. But the thing has traction and he finds his way to the front every single night. Terrence Spacek, number four. Number three. Probably going to get some hate mail because they probably figures he should be higher. And maybe so. Maybe so. But I'm putting Dexton Cook at number three. And I tell you, possibly the last month, Bert, he was faster than the 7 eight. the last month. I think Shane might have had some issues. Maybe, maybe not. Shane did win the last race. But Dexton Cook really looks strong at the end of the season. And, uh, you know, keep an eye on him. He, the goal for the 7 gate this year is to win the national championship. Tall task, tall task. If you don't get 30 wins, it's not even a conversation because you know the 7A is good, right? So you've got to get 30 wins, but Dexton Cook, uh, very strong, going to put him at number three. Number two, my favorite number, 71, Trevor Nelson. Now some of the South Dakota people are going to be like, well, hey, he went to the 100 and he beat Shane Sabrowski. Well, yeah, once. Okay. Hell of a night, but once. But that's kind of what's been haunting him, right? Because he, he dominates in South Dakota. He dominates at Aberdeen. He dominates at Miller. Runs strong in Western Minnesota. But he, he really had been lacking that marquee win. He outdueled the 7-8. That does not happen often. And it's close. He's right there in the conversation. If he had a Sunday track, a Thursday track, I promise you he'd be in the conversation for a national championship. For 20 wins out of 31 races, that's impressive. That's a hell of a win count right there. So Trevor Nelson at number two, and I, I think you probably guessed this one right. Number one, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to say. I mean, 35 wins on the year. I mean, like I said, it takes 30 wins to even be in the conversation with this guy for a national championship. The Iron Man, Shane Sabrowski, and you know, thoughts and prayers to the Sabrowski family. He just lost his grandpa here a couple of years ago, Bert, and you know, just a, a very tight knit racing family. So. You know, want to give our condolences to the Sabrowski family for, for that big loss right there. But Shane Sabrowski, easily the number one. I mean, when all five of these guys, when they unload at the racetrack, right, they're, they're going to be in the conversation. But Shane is so, so consistent. I mean, so incredibly smooth. It looks like it's like effortless him driving that car around the racetrack. And I don't think anything's going to change. And he's going to make everybody else elevate their game. It'll be fun to see if anybody has a little bit for him in 2023. All right. Uh, good stuff there. Uh, let's move on to the Wasota Modifieds. Uh, I think I might know who the top driver is. And I think I might know some other drivers who might be on the list. I'm a little bit more familiar with the Modifieds. I want you to go ahead and I want you to guess, right? We'll, we'll, we'll play that game. I want you to guess the top five in, in no particular order. You can guess one. You can guess one. One, but one's got to be TPO. We'll see. Um, I uh, Sabraski on there. We'll see. Okay. Uh, Jody Belfi. And we'll then uh, another name I'm familiar with are the Estes. <laughs> so. 
got a couple, right? You got a couple, okay. right? Okay. <laughs> so, I'm going to start with some people that caught my eye, okay? So, Jack Reward, four, I think fourth generation racer, for sure third, fourth, I believe. Three wins in his rookie year, and he looks strong. He ran very well, um, ran well at some of the invitationals, had a really strong run at the Silver 1000, and uh, congratulations, he's going to go to Stout. I saw that online. But, uh, you know, I've known his dad. I raced against his dad for a number of years in the Superstock. But Jack Reboard is a guy to keep an eye on here in 2023. Another young gun, and he was down at the Dome. Kind of had a – he was fast down there, too. Joe Thomas, second-generation driver. Um, he started getting a lot faster at the end of last year. And uh, mark, mark this down right now. Write this down. Joe Thomas is going to finish in the top five in the Wissota points this year. Another guy here, he don't race much. He's like semi-retired. Buzzy Adams, I mean, he, he called his rock. He won the, the punky, and he's like, I'm still the best modified guy around. <laughs> Bold, but that yeah, might be true. I tell you what, Buzzy's one of my favorite guys to ever st step into a race car. I, I just enjoy watching him race. I call him the human highlight reel. Kind of fun to watch. And, you know, kind of a storyline for, for 2023 in Wasoda Modifieds. Cheyenne Speedway over in Lisbon, North Dakota. Um, they moved to Thursdays and they're going to run modifieds, with soda modifieds on a weekly basis. Now, the national champion the last two years was from North Dakota. So that gives him a leg up, right? Now he's got a Thursday track right near home. So he's going to have him, Joe Thomas, I expect them there. Probably some of the South Dakota guys going to come up. So that's going to give them one more night over there in uh, the Western region of Wasota Modifieds. And uh, Johnny Broking sounds a little bit more motivated, like he might run a little bit more. So it's going to be a fun battle. This might be the close. I mean, we had a good battle a couple years ago, right, with TPO and Sabraski. Between, you know, with all the top guys, I think we're going to have a hell of a battle this year in the Wasota Modified Division. I'm excited for it. So let's start with number five, the Hermantown Hammer, Daryl Nelson. Mm, when, yeah. he, when the money was <laughs> on the line, Bert, I'm telling you, I mean, he was unbelievable. Both classes, modified and late model, silver 1,000 he won. He won the legendary 100, second at the punky to, to Buzzy Adams, who we just talked about. Daryl Nelson, when, when you're talking about the fear factor, right, you're up in northern Minnesota, and this is no – I'm and I'm not talking Rapids Hibbing and all that. We'll get to that conversation in a minute. But like the Twin Ports, right? We're talking Superior Proctor. He didn't really run Proctor much. But in that area, Jody Belfi is good. He ain't Daryl Nelson. I think he'd say that himself. Jody's a hell of a race car driver. Daryl Nelson is one of the most versatile drivers I've ever seen, right? It don't matter if it's smooth and dry, if there's a cushion, if there's ruts, if it's mud. He finds a way to make it work. He was one of the guys that when I raced mods, I did not like when he was in, when he was behind me on a restart. Cause if I went to the top, he's going to the bottom. He's that fun to watch. Daryl Nelson, number five, number four, Dale Ames. What a season he had out in South Dakota. They had a, a really cool deal. I'm going to give a shout out to the three tracks, um, Brown County and Aberdeen Miller and casino speedway. They had what was called the triple crown. They put together a little point series that were select nights out there. All the classes jumped in it together. Dale Ames won that $5,000 payday. He also came over um, to Ashland, ABC Raceway. Never been there. Parked it in Victory Lane at a special there. And he won a lot of big races, a lot of big money races this past year. The best season he's ever had. And uh, just a great year. Dale Ames at number four. Number three, I'm going to go with the Iron Man, Shane Sabraski quietly right quietly if there's such a thing he quietly won 19 features but he just didn't ever really look like he was a dominant guy maybe maybe that's just a sight thing but he's always in the conversation right i mean is there i don't know if there's a more smooth driver than shane sabraski he's so smooth he's consistent he typically stays out of trouble sabraski number three and at number two, I'm going to put Johnny Broke. I'll probably get some hate mail because people are going to be like, how do you put Shane Sabrasky behind Johnny Broke? I just think he's more fun to watch. I don't know. He's up on the wheel. I mean, I would, I would buy a ticket to watch this guy and the next guy I'm going to talk about. 
Shane, I love Shane Sebraski. I love the whole family. He's one of the best to ever strap in. It's like watching T-Mac. It's boring. Right, it's it's boring. It just kind of it's like he's driving around on an asphalt track. Makes it look too easy, right? These other guys, they're up on the wheel. They're gonna do something. It could be good, bad, or indifferent. They're gonna make some noise. They're gonna make something happen. But Johnny Broking, Advantage RV Modified um, Tour Champion for the second straight year, um, he put on a hell of a show. Lost to Sabraski and TPO at the 100, but he was probably the most fun to watch. Um, but just a uh, a great season for him. Kind of ran a limited schedule, but I keep an eye on him. I think he's going to make some noise this, couple, this coming year. And at number one, Johnny's bitter rival. He ain't going to like this. Okay, Johnny, if you want to be number one, you better beat this guy a little bit more. I know you beat him some last year. He beat you. You're both fun to race against, but I want to see you guys go head to head a hell of a lot more. I would buy tickets to see that. The one TPO of Tyler Peterson. 30 wins on the season, Bert, unbelievable storybook season for him. Um, won the Wasota 100. I mean, he he just had a, a great – I think he, he might have been undefeated in Greenbush. I think he won – if he lost one, it was just one. He won, like, everything. You get him on them bull rings, he was super fun to watch. But, I mean, then you get to a, kind of a momentum track at I-94. He won the 100 there. Um, 30 wins on the season in the Wasota Modified. That's a tall task, Bert. He got it done. Tyler Peterson, number one. All right. Now let's uh, move on to uh, Puka's favorite division, uh, the the late great models. Late, great, late that? great late models. Great late models. Great late models, yeah. The 604s <laughs> and the 603s and the 602s. He likes right. all of them. Um, but, yeah, the late model division, and I'm curious. Um, obviously, I know this division the best of all of the divisions that we've discussed so far. So I'm interested to see what kind of love you give uh, Eastern Wisconsin um, and uh, where are the other drivers from? I mean, AJ Demel didn't race a lot, but when he did race, he won. Um, Pat Doerr had another uh, very good season. And uh, like, you, like we said earlier in our show, uh, Jimmy Mars is always uh, um, winning locally. So... Um, I'm curious to see where the drivers fall on this list. I mean, when you look at this, right, I mean, Pat Doerr, I mean, AJ Demo just doesn't run enough to be in the conversation, but he's good enough. I mean, he's one of those talents kind of annoys me, right? He could take like a month off, get in a car, win. I, I never could do that. I kind of had to race a lot more to be competitive. AJ Demo, phenomenal race car driver. Pat Doerr had a great year, light on the wind counts, but he overall super consistent. I mean, Pat Doerr is Pat Doerr. Um, another guy caught my eye, rookie Danny Vang. Uh, four wins on the year as a rookie, national rookie of the year. He was right up front there uh, in the top. I think he got third in the Wasota National Standings. Ran well at some big money races. Look forward to seeing him kind of progress in that KME 47. Um, another uh, another couple drivers here, Bert, that didn't quite make the list. Daryl Nelson. You know, he had three wins in two seconds at invite time. I mean, when it came to September, when it came to the Silver 1000 on, he was on mission. I mean, he, that might have been the best postseason that anybody's had in a long time. There is a guy here that had a little bit better one this year, but Daryl Nelson just outside the list. Another guy, back-to-back -back NLRA championships, Mike Gressa. Mike, to be in the top five, you learn how to get her on the track if they water it. <laughs> just saying, I pick on him. He, he's going to hate me for that. Mike Gressa, very smooth, hell of a race car driver. He's been very strong. When the track slicks off, he is very, very tough to beat. Um, but he's got to get a little bit more versatile. And like you said, I, I pay for this thing. I don't want to go tear up equipment. I only have so much, and I don't want to spend all that kind of money. So I get it. I get it. Um, another guy that had a great year, Tri-State Series uh, champion, Trevor Anderson. Um, great year in the Tri-State Series, taking home his first championship there. So congratulations to him. Well, let's get into the top five. Number five, your Wasota late model national champion, 14 wins on the year, the hot shoe Chad Becker. Becker had a great season. He did. I mean, he's he's that perennial points runner, and he runs mostly home. He runs Aberdeen. He runs Miller. He runs Casino. He runs his three tracks. He's fortunate enough to have three tracks that race in his area. He heads out. He hits a few specials now and then highly competitive every single time he unloads the car. And if you're racing for a national championship, I promise 
that 12 car is going to be in the conversation every single year. Number four, Don Shaw. Don Shaw had a great postseason, Bert. He won at Fargo right before the Labor Day weekend there. They had, I think it was an NLRA show with the World of Outlaws. He won that. He got second at the prelude to the Johnny. Then he won another John Seitz Memorial. Got it done at, at the Seitz. Then he got second at the 100 to the next guy or to one of the next guys on the list. He won the Jamestown Stampede, perhaps a little controversy at that one. And then uh, I tell you, I mean, a guy that when he unloads the car in the conversation, super fast, you know, kind of hosting events. He'll be doing some winter racing um, down in Arizona. Plus he's hosting a little series down there, but I'm going to put Don Shaw at number four. Number three, we're going to head over to Eastern Wisconsin. The 15 of Nick Anvilink. I don't know how many wins he had, but he's only lost one Dirt Kings championship. And it's because he didn't follow the series that year. I mean, yep. he's the most dominant car in Eastern Wisconsin. He travels well. He runs good everywhere he goes. Um, another guy, easy on equipment. But what do you got to say? You get to see this guy all the time. What do you have to say about Nick Anvilink? I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, he, he's definitely the best late model driver from Eastern Wisconsin right now. And uh, what impressed me about this past season, um, I mean, he's always traveled, but um, he re really hasn't won any races traveling the last few years. Uh, but this year he won uh, one of the uh, local late model shows at Cedar Lake during USA National Weekends this year. Uh, he finished in on the podium at uh, uh, the Red Clay Classic up in Ashland because he had, I saw the picture of him wearing the dress. And, um, he started and uh, back too. I think he started what, like road, didn't he? And at the Red Clay, he started back a ways. I'm not sure where he started, but yeah, he had a good run there. I mean, he's, he's he has won that race in the past, and um, he ran well at Menominee this year. The, the when he did race there, so. You know, he put together a good season locally as well as, you know, traveling to uh, Western Wisconsin. So, uh, you know, and but uh, probably his, his most, his biggest accomplishment this year was probably winning the Dirt Kings race at uh, Gravity Park uh, because he was the first driver to win that race that didn't start on the front row. So he got 20 bucks for me. So that's probably his, uh, his best accomplishment of the season. <laughs> I want to know what he spent that 20 bucks on. That's <laughs> probably <laughs> beer. <laughs> right, right. Number two, we're going to go with the ice man, Jimmy Mars. Undefeated at major Memorial races held at the red Cedar speedway in Menominee. He won it again. Um, had a, had a, had a battle there to get it done. But Jimmy Mars, um, unbelievable. I mean, just a great talent. He's, I mean, he's done a lot for the sport. Another Wissota 100 win. I mean, let's face it, Bert, any one of these guys on the list, right, when they unload the car, if you're at a, a, a regional show, you're like, yeah, they're fast. There, there's no question. Jimmy Mars probably instills more fear than about anybody because he has done it for a long time. He's done it at a high level. And uh, Jimmy Mars, we're going to put him at number two, but out with the old and in with the new. And at number one, we're going to put Cole Searing. Cole Searing won the national championship a year ago. And this year he says, you know what? I started a business, I'm going to focus on family, and I'm going to hit the money shows. And he did. And he ran well at all of them. He won the 5,000 win deal at Huron. Perhaps a little gift. Thank you, Kent Arment, um, for that one. And uh, second at the Masters, the 10,000 to win show at the Masters. He got runner up to Jimmy Mars. I think Jimmy, yeah, Jimmy won that as well. Um, Challenge Series, he won the Structural Buildings with Soda Late Model Challenge Series Championship. And every single money show, Bert, he, if he wasn't in the top three, he was top five. He was there every single night. Cole Searing, I said it two years ago when he got into that late model. By the end of the season, I'm like, this dude's a rookie and he's the fastest late model in South Dakota. He's one of the fastest late models in the whole region. 
Cole Searing, your number one driver in the area in late models in 2022. All right, that's a pretty good list. And uh, uh, as you said, I mean, there's some <laughs> damn good drivers that didn't make the top five. So, uh, sure. um, so it's it's uh, if you're on that list, uh, you had a great season. Uh, so we have one more top five to go, and that would be the super late models on the national scene. And I kind of have an idea in my head on what my list would be. So I'm curious to see what yours would be. Well, I want to hear yours. Why don't you go first? Go ahead and share with us. And then I'll just uh, I'll touch on mine if it's a little different. Okay. I'm going to, number five, I'm going to go with uh, Chris Madden. Uh, he won a lot of big money shows. Uh, he did have a little bit of a drought uh, midway through the year, but he did win a lot of big money shows. Uh, number four, I'm going to go with uh, Brandon Shepard. Um, he uh, switched to Lucas this year. He didn't win the title, but uh, he was he was in contention all year. And then he also won some uh, some races in the family owned car uh, that he raced in in Illinois. And number three, I'm going to go with uh, Dennis Erb Jr. Uh, me, I think championships mean something, and he won the World of Outlaw Championship, so I'm going to put him at number three. Uh, number two, I put uh, T Mac there, won the Lucas Oil uh, Championship. And then, I mean, obviously, number one is uh, <laughs> the $2 million man, Jonathan Davenport. And B Chef won the Castro Flow Racing Night in America. Oh, champion. that's right. Okay. Yeah. I actually I would probably flip flop him with Dennis Herb Jr. I'd put B Chef at three and Herb Jr. at uh, four. All all very strong. I mean, every one of them had great seasons. <clears throat> I'm gonna put at number five, I'm gonna go with the smooth operator, Bobby Pierce. Right. Now Bobby Pierce, 21 wins, he won the UMP <laughs> Summer Nationals Hell Tour. Um, for like the 872nd time. Okay. So he got that done, but he's the guy that he, out of all the cushion pushing hard charger type of guys, I would say he's the one that is most consistent to kind of work his way to the front. Um, Bobby Pierce at number five. And I don't have Shepard in the top five. Okay. Great, great season. One, well, like I said, he won the Castro Flow Racing Night in America series. Brandon Shepard is. I mean, if I was a car owner and I was looking for somebody to go win a championship, win a bunch of races, he'd be on the list. I can promise you that. Hell of a season, but he just fell short. Number four, I'm going to go with big, sexy Brandon Overton. Podiums. I look back, Bert, and he didn't have quite as many wins as, as maybe one would have hoped, but he did win his third straight dream. He did win that. And you look at all the big shows. If you go through all the crown jewels and all the big money shows, he was there in every one of them. If he wasn't, if he didn't win, he was like second, third, fourth. He was in the conversation. So Brandon Overton at number four. At number three, T-Mac, Tim McCready. He is your perennial point. He's like, you know, he's like Chad Becker, right? He's the point. If there's a championship to be won, he knows how to win a championship. Second straight Lucas Oil late model series championship, T-Mac at number three. And, and I, I like the conversation. He said, he goes, you know, a lot of these guys are a little more fortunate, right? You got JD, you got some of these guys not racing for points. They can kind of try stuff during the season. He's like, I'm racing for a championship. I can't get too far off the beaten path because I'm trying to win the championship. I can't just have a couple bad nights in a row. And that, that that's an interesting point that he had, but he's still in the conversation. Every well, night. And uh, I mean, we don't have it on tonight's agenda, but it's something that we'll have to talk about in a future show is uh, the, the change to the points in, in the Lucas oil series, how they're going to determine the champion this year. Yeah. We'll talk about some of that stuff as we come into a little closer to speed weeks and so on. Number two, I'm going to go with smoky Chris Madden. Bert, he was inches inches away from winning the million he slide job jd and just let it go a little too far and jd crossed him over and took home the million if he literally just gives him the quarter when he goes by or doesn't slide as far we're talking about chris madden at number one we're talking about him if you take away the million to win race that jd had right 
he wasn't that far off. He was number two in money earners, won a lot of those big XR shows. So a great year for Chris Madden. And at number one, I mean, come on. I mean, how do you, I mean, like you said, not just, if you take away the million, he was still the top earner. If you took away the million, he was still the number one earner on the year. And that's Superman, Jonathan Davenport. I mean, I mean, just an, after speed weeks, like I said, at speed weeks, he sucked. He didn't have a good speed weeks, but from that point on, he, he put it on, uh, on cruise control. It'll be interesting to see, right? New crew chief this year. So that'll be interesting to see how that dynamic changes. With that said, uh, Jonathan Davenport, it'll be fun to see. we got Wild West Shootout coming up. We're going to see if that makes a, a difference down there. A couple other notable things in 2023. Silly season, right? Um, you got you got two Illini guys, Brandon Shepard, Bobby Pierce, both jumping into Longhorns this year. That'll be an interesting. Bert, which one of them is going to win more features with their Longhorn chassis in 2023? Um, I'm going to say Bobby Pierce because I uh, partly because he races a lot of uh, the summer nationals tour. So I think he can get more victories uh, by following that tour um, than what Shepard's going to get um, for if, if Shepard decides to follow, has he made a decision on if he's following world of outlaws or Lucas or is he racing? Outlaws. Okay. Okay. But a lot of that doesn't, you know, a lot of that doesn't really happen until after speed weeks, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so let's get, before we get to ahead of ourselves there, let's get through speed weeks, right? Um, another thing that we just got announced today, speaking of late models, Jimmy Owens. We talked about, or I mentioned on the show that I think he's going to get that Ty Torg ride, I think is what I was talking about, or maybe one of the rides. And uh, he ended up going to a different ride. He's going to be driving for Kaler Motorsports, and uh, they had some crate late models out there. And uh, he's, he got a brand new ride, just got announced today from what I saw. So Jimmy Owens, that'll be interesting to see if he can rejuvenate his career. Well, and the interesting thing about that, that announcement, I read it and uh, Jimmy Owens said that, you know, his trailer was empty and his shop is empty right now. So, I mean, we're in the first week of January and he has no cars in his shop right now. Uh, but I believe he said they're getting two Longhorns. So, uh, you know, he's been a rocket guy in the past. And I know he's dabbled with Longhorns. Um, if I remember correctly, the press release said Longhorns, though. I, I did not know that. I did not read far enough into the press release. That's interesting. Another Longhorn there. So that'll be, I tell you, Steve Arpin doing a hell of a job down there. That kid is a flat out marketing expert. I mean, he's got the charisma. I always knew that he was going to be successful and he's got all the contacts. A lot of these people moving over to Longhorn, I'm telling you right now that I think Steve Arpin's got a lot to yeah. do with that. And now that I remember, um, I do remember that correctly because they're going to be Longhorns by Wells. And oh. yeah. And, um, and also, I found interesting reading that press release because the car owners two sons have raced crate late models and one of them's going to be racing super late models this year. So I'm wondering if part of this deal is, you know, Jimmy's going to be kind of a mentor for, for, for those guys also. Probably a good idea because very knowledgeable, very even keeled guy, right? He's a, he's got that mindset, kind of that demeanor that probably could help somebody advance their career. And uh, one of the best ever strap in. So, I mean, if you're going to have a teacher, why not Jimmy Owens, right? So let's jump into, uh, let's jump into another topic. What do we got next year? Bert? Well, we don't, uh, we're not going to do the top five, but uh, do you have a top donkey award of the year? <laughs> I do. I do. And uh, I, I think, I think that tire deal, right. I mean, and we're going to touch a little bit more on that, but I mean, raising the, the cost of tires, um, when you don't really need to, I, I think that's got to be the top donkey award, but I'm going to spin this around, right? I'm going to spin this around. Let's face it, but racers hate money. They hate money, right? It's kind of like the old adage, right? You know, you have a couple, they're dating, right? And the guy's well, like... Racers don't, don't, racers don't hate money. They hate money in their pocket. Clearly, <laughs> clearly, for sure, for sure. So, so think about this. You got a couple, right? They're dating, and the guy's like, you know what? I, I, I don't know really if I... I'm kind of over her. I, I kind of want to move on, right? That's kind of the, the mind... You know, he's, he's kind of... You know, you, you've seen relationships like that, you know, where the guy's like, you know what? I, 
I just think I'm going to move to a different direction. I, I think this is going to be done, but he's not quite willing to end it. Right. And then next thing you know, she ends it and he's devastated. I can't believe she broke up with me. You know what? To be together with her, with her in the first place. This is race car drivers, right? Race car drivers are like, I, I, I'll spend every single dollar I have, right? Every dollar I have. But if somebody else makes a decision that costs me a little bit of money, I'm going to lose my shit, right? Now, think about this. I was looking down at Cocopa Speedway, right? Down in uh, Yuma, Arizona. They got like a hundred modifieds down there, Bert. Like a hundred mods. It's a thousand to win each night. It's a hundred dollars from 12th back. Right. So you look at that, you look at East Bay, you look at Bristol, Vegas deal, you look at um, Volusia, you look at the payout for these shows and people drive all the way across the country to go race these shows for free. But God forbid you cost them another $400 on the year entire bill. What are we talking about? Right. Or, or you have the, the racer that has a, Two hundred and fifty thousand or three hundred thousand dollar hauler, right? We've seen them. We got we all know people who got big, big haulers, and the only track they race at is the one ten minutes from home. Mm -hmm. and, and some of these people were bitching about when I brought up the tire deal. They're like, I can't believe they did that to us. I'm like, I was thinking about that. And I had some conversations. They're like, there's people that literally have half a million dollar haulers and never leave their home track. I'm sorry, but like this whole, they probably don't need to be quite as upset about the time. I mean, it's a principle thing for sure. It's a principle, you know, but at the end of the day, I mean, I mean, racers are going to spend every single dollar they have and then some, but if somebody else spends their money, they're really upset. So the top donkey award is that tire deal, but maybe a conglomerated, I'll, I'll group myself into this deal. Cause I I'm at heart. I'm, a, I'm still a racer. Some people are like, Oh, you're media. I ain't media. I'm a, I'm a former racer that loves racing that likes to talk about racing so you know i'll put some egg on my face because you know we'll bitch about somebody else spending a few dollars of ours but we'll spend every single dollar we have so yeah, i think we just got to put things into perspective just a little bit here right so bert let's jump into the last lap brought to you by zuli's race engines and i can assure you of this right you're going to see all year long Zuli's race engines in Victory Lane. We talked about some of their drivers here earlier tonight in the top fives. Um, just look at their Facebook page. If you can't beat them, join them. Get a hold of Zuli's race engines for all the power you need to park in Victory Lane in 2023. I'm going to start with a little somber news, Bert. Uh, we all know, you know the name Joey Jensen, Brandon Jensen. Their dad, big Joe Jensen, he lost his life here within a week or so ago, um, long, long battle with cancer. I mean, he used to pit for Rick Eggersdorf in the Olsen brother liquors 21 cars. And that's why Joey and Brandon were both 21. That was their number for a long time is because of that tie. And uh, man, I was really hoping to get down and have a conversation with him and Rick Eggersdorf. And I know he had a lot of great stories, left a great legacy in, in dirt racing, loved the sport. A lot of people really liked, you know, really liked him. He had a lot of great, uh, you know, a lot of great moments, you know, with his kids racing, all the moments with Eggersdorf, it's a big loss to the racing community. Uh, thoughts and prayers to the Jensen family. Bert, what do we got next? Well, the Dirt Million is returning, but... <laughs> sprint cars, it's going to be buggy action this year. So my buddy Keith can be excited at sprint cars racing for a <laughs> Late models racing for a million. So the question is, Posse or outlaw driver winning the million early prediction. We, we, we won't go on the record as one of our bold predictions with this. That's just something to think about. You don't even need to answer right now, but I think Brent Marks kind of handed them their ass this year. A, a couple big shows over there in Eldora, you know, so you look Tyler Courtney, Kyle Larson, who doesn't run any series. It's going to be interesting to see. That's going to be a big, big race. There's going to be a lot of good drivers at it. Now here's a question for you. So the biggest race in, I think, sprint car history, I believe, I could be wrong, but I think this is right. Just a few years back at the Badlands Speedway, it was 250000 to win. Do you know where the Badlands Speedway was? 
now two cents. That's when okay. they had the different order, the bad left. So now they got a different order. Todd Quaring comes in, right? And they announced that, hey, we're going to have another 250000 to win race at Cusick's. And he had to been thinking, like, this is the biggest race in sprint car history. And here comes Sony Stewart. Hey, hold my beer. We'll just go ahead and make that a million. It's got to sting just a little bit. That's going to be a big event at both nonetheless. But um, Dirt Million at Eldora for the sprint cars. That's going to be fun to watch. Now, Bert, let's jump into our uh, – Let's jump into our three bold predictions. I'm going to let you start and uh, quantifiable. We're going to keep track of this. We have a few on record here from last year still. We'll kind of get into that next week. But uh, racing related, show related, something in motorsports, something that we can actually like put a, a value on like it, it did or did not happen. Okay. And uh, let's, let's starting this year, we're going to keep track of this too. Okay. We're going to, you and I will just have a little fun little competition and uh, w- the winner will buy dinner or something at the end of the year. Okay. And, unless I win, and then you got to buy me a car or something. Um, so number, number, uh, let's go with three bold predictions, Bert. Why don't you go first with one that I'll go. We'll kind of go back and forth. Here. Okay. I will go um, a X mod driver from Minnesota we'll finish in the top three in points at the wild west shootout okay okay x mod driver from minnesota top three at the wild west shootout i'm gonna stop you know it's kind of funny because my first one is kind of related to that but i'm gonna go with this a wasoda regular car so the wasoda drivers somebody that typically runs with soda okay so Wasoda drivers will combine for a minimum of four feature wins at the Wild West shootout. So in all divisions, eh, it's probably not going to be late models, but um, I would say, yeah, modifieds and X mods between those two classes, there will be at least four feature wins accounted for by Wasoda regular drivers. And this is in Vado. So, All right. So, so Ryan Aho is saying that Dustin Sorensen will not win a feature down in Arizona. <laughs> yeah, I'll go on the record to say that. I think he's, have a good, he's got a lot of upside, a lot of potential. But uh, that list of drivers going down there, kind of your first, I think that's a pretty tall task to see that car in victory lane down there. All right. Uh, my second one. Um, I'm saying this basically because I saw a Facebook post of um, uh, leaving for leaving for the West. Uh, Dan Ebert will uh, finish in the top five in two features at the Wild West Shootout. Okay. Well, he had rough luck. I think he wrecked on night one or night two last year. Went home, but uh, he's got new cars. He's coming out. He's got Mullins chassis this year, so he's out of the out of the lethal into the Mullins. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what that 60 car can do down there. Um, do we count him as a Wasota car? Because he runs, he's a Wasota area driver, um, but he ran mostly USMTS the last two years. I'd I probably mean, consider him a Wasota car. Yeah, we'll claim him as one of our own for sure. For sure. Okay, so I'm going to go with the smooth operator, Bobby Pierce will have more wins than Brandon Shepard in the Longhorn in 2023. Okay. Um, I will go with uh, Tyler Erb will carry over the his dome success and win one of the late model features this weekend. This weekend or over the whole? This, this weekend. This weekend. This week, one of the first two nights then at Vado. Tyler Herb is going to win. Okay. Okay. I'm going to go Chili Bowl direction, and there's going to be over 20 <laughs> rollover at the Chili Bowl. I don't know what the record is, but we can look that up. But I'm going to go over 20 rollovers. Speaking of the Chili Bowl, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, Kyle Hammer, Don, they were going to go race late model stuff. They're still going to, but Don, Don, Don will go buy stuff on a whim. He went out and bought a a midget Kyle Hammer is going to run at the Chili Bowl in a in a midget here uh, this coming week. It's kind of interesting. So this week uh, racing's officially started, right? They got the deal done at Coca Pass, my MCA stuff. They had the Tulsa shootout, 
but this is the first big week, right? I mean, t- I mean, I get it. The Chili Bowl is huge. The open wheel guys, Chili Bowl is huge. But Wild West shootout, for me, that kind of starts things off, right? I mean, not that we won't watch a Chili Bowl. The Alphabet Soup Night is worth it all by itself. That's a, that's a fun event to watch. Kyle Larson not going to be there. He's going to be in Vado, right? So that's, that's kind of a cool deal. But uh, racing finally underway. We had a little bit of an off season there. And uh, we're back in the swing of things. We got a few new people getting in with our picks. Um, so that's going to be kind of fun this year. We got a little bit more. Uh, we're going to try to dethrone first. You got two in a row here. We can't be, can't, you can't go three in a row. So fun to, fun to get back after it. And, you know, any closing thoughts? I got, I got one closing thought here, but any, anything that you want to close with? Anything you think we missed? Um, well, it's, it's hard to believe that uh, <laughs> racing season is, I mean, up, I mean, actually today though, um, it was like 37 degrees and it was raining here in, uh, in Eastern Wisconsin. So we had, we had one week that was cold. Otherwise it hasn't been too bad of a winter so far, but I probably just jinxed that. And now it's going to be cold for the next two months. Um, but it's hard to believe that, uh, we're, uh, that the season's going to be starting already. And, um, you know, it was nice taking a break and, you know, I, I can see, you know, how, why the race teams would really need somewhat of a break. Um, but we're, we're back at it and we'll be, we'll be at it um, every week now. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I'm happy you don't wear your Packers stuff because I saw one of our fans of the show commented said, Hey, you should wear some, you got bragging rights. You do <laughs> Hit out of my Vikings here this past week. That was kind of that kind of sucked. But hey, racing season is here. Um, but I will say this: uh, this coming Saturday, something's coming up here. This Saturday, I believe it's Saturday. Don't you have a birthday coming up? A week from Saturday. A week from Saturday. Okay. Okay. 14th. So I it was close. What day is 14th. it? Fourteenth. All right, we're jumping the gun. But my dad, <laughs> my dad, uh, good old Rudy. Um, his birthday on the 10th, right? So what day is it today? Is it the 4th? So yes, yeah. no, yes, so, yes, 4th. Yeah, so by the time people are listening to this, it'll be the 5th or 6th or whatever. But on the 10th, you know, hey, don't be afraid to get them on Facebook, call them, text them. Um, he likes calls typically around 2, 3 in the morning. Um, <laughs> be sure on the 10th to wish my dad a happy birthday. So with that said, Bert, uh, fun to be back. Glad to be talking racing. Looking forward to a great 2023. I'm Ryan Aho. That is the Bert Lehman. Thanks for tuning in to the One to Go Show.